Hello and welcome back to part two of BPMN Modeling Patterns. Unless, of course, that you didn't watch the first one, in which case, just welcome, I guess. Uh, and I hope you enjoy yourself while you're here. So, in the first video, we discussed very common solutions to very common modeling problems. Specifically, we talked about how to escalate situations within a BPMN context and also how you can prepare for KPIs during the modeling um, rather than after deployment. Today we're going to be talking, talking about three more patterns. Those are we're going to talk about dealing with fatal problems. So this is where, hey, your process has a happy path. We love that. We hope it goes that direction. But if it does not, you need to have pre prepared some kind of eventuality for that. And we'll talk about some of the things to keep into uh, account when you're doing that. We'll talk about reusable processes uh, and subprocesses in general, how to use them, why, and the best practices around them. And secondly, a very common pattern where you want to do four eyes principle or have uh, other people uh, uh, being able to validate uh, certain let's say data or objects or something within your process so that's the plan for today as before just as a reminder in the previous video I'll be using the Kamuna desktop modeler which you can download for free the link is below and you'll see me using token simulation throughout this that's a plugin that you can get your hands on for free as well and details for that are also below so with that done let's speed ahead to the first pattern which is going to be around um, handling errors. So for this first example, I've taken some inspiration from this little egg shaped thing to my left and we're going to talk about playing rugby. So generally speaking, this I've modeled the happy path. This is what I want to happen every time I play rugby, which is I want to play, I play, I then celebrate my victory. Winning is great. Who doesn't love winning? So that is pretty solid. Now naming convention is weirdly important when it comes to things that happen outside the happy path. The happy path here suggests that right now the only possible outcome of playing rugby is that you win. Now occasionally I must admit that that doesn't always happen, especially supporting uh, a team like Ireland, which you know do very well but don't always win. So we need to take into account um, the fact we lose. Now here's the very first thing that I need we need to t discuss, which is playing rugby just that the name of that task indicates the potential outcome. For instance, losing at rugby or winning at rugby are two things that could happen after the successful completion of this task. Think of it as well as like approving an invoice. Approving an invoice can uh, can be approved or rejected, right? But either way, the task has successfully completed. Now remember that, I'll come back to that later, because in that case right now, if something goes wrong for my happy path, in this case, I don't win, I would quite like to just have a simple gateway here that checks and resolves what happens based on the previous uh, task. So in this case it would be, uh, did you win? And I have a yes right here, the happy path, and then I can also add uh, another task here for, um, uh, let's say complain about team as the other possible option. So this is a no and um, losing is terrible. Okay, so this makes complete sense. So what we have here is the very first step towards sort of error handling to a degree, this particular type of error handling where the potential is we play rugby while this game is happening right? It has two potential outcomes. Then when it does happen, we can evaluate what happens next and then go to the place where we think it's going to happen. Okay, cool. That's a great example. But rugby is a very, very complicated sport. Uh, it's also a very dangerous sport. So let's talk about the potential of if I were to go play rugby and which has happened to me in the past, I get injured during the game. That's interesting because in that case, I cannot possibly get to either celebrate or complain because I immediately need to get to hospital. So in that case, we actually don't want to have another gateway that says you've been injured, go to hospital, right? So because in this case, you actually would need the game to finish before being able to go to hospital, which, you know, maybe you shouldn't wait for that to happen. So this is where we actually have the first idea of understanding the difference between a successful completion and an unhappy path versus a problem that happens that means we will never be able to fully complete the task. So in this case, I'm going to use an error event. So this error event is uh, you get hurt and we go up here and we go to hospital. 
Now, in this case, you can neither celebrate a victory because you're in the hospital and you can neither complain about the team because you have no idea uh, what would have happened uh, had you stayed on the field. Um, you can probably complain about the team if they put you in hospital, if that makes sense. So in this case, the wording is really important. Now, if we once again use the example of the invoice, if we, if we were doing our invoice example here and we had the two options, it's approved or it's not, an error event may happen if, for instance, the data is corrupted. It's a method by which you're supposed to use these error events in situations where the completion of this task based on the wording of the task is not possible due to some unforeseen thing that requires you to cancel out of it. So that's pretty good. There is other options though. For instance, there's other types of error handling that might happen that don't necessarily have to interrupt the process. So in rugby, there is the ability to go off the field temporarily if you're only a little bit injured. It's called a blood substitute. So that means that the game will still be happening and actually you can rejoin the game, um, but you don't have to completely tag out. You don't have to quit playing and then go somewhere else. The error event in particular is always interrupting, meaning that if an error is caused by this, it'll always interrupt the current task it's been thrown on and then go the other way. What we would like to do is throw essentially a non-interrupting thing because we don't want to go to hospital. We just want to say, hey, I'm injured. I need someone to stitch me and give me a bandage, but then I'm basically back on the field in a couple of minutes. So for that, we can use a different kind of event that works in almost exactly the same way. It is an escalation boundary event, specifically a non-interrupting one with the dashed lines there. So this while the game is going on, so, and I'll demonstrate this shortly, we will tag this and go down here. So let's show you how that might look. So this would be, um, you have been uh, slightly hurt, which is fine, you'll be fine. And then you're going to uh, get patched up. And this happens in parallel to, the, to you being part of the game, right? So you can do this on the field if you want, which does happen sometimes in rugby. So, uh, and then you feel great. Okay, so how does this look from a token simulation perspective? Well, let's play a game to find out. So I'm gonna turn on simulation. I'm going to add a little pause here and I'm gonna arrive. So we've started our game, things are going great. Tiny problem, we have been hurt, but that's okay because as we know, we can still be playing, get patched up and still be doing it. Fun fact, you might get hurt multiple times which is a bit of a shame. Uh, you might even get hurt so many times you have to then go to hospital, but we're going to avoid that route for now. In, uh, well, you know what? Maybe that might happen because I, I, I'm very easily hurt actually. So I will say that we get hurt then, then we interrupt and go away, which is not a great, not a great experience for anybody. So let's imagine a more happier path. So in which case no one gets hurt, in which case we would simply say, um, we play, we play our rugby, we then have won, we celebrate our victory, winning is great. This then takes care of kind of most situations that may occur within a general pattern. And just to reiterate, the issues, to, the things to remember are the kinds of things that you may affect your happy flow that are, aren't necessarily failures of the task will be used by a gateway. So that'll be improve, uh, approve or reject invoice. Things that happen that may make things impossible to continue would be, for instance, getting hurt. Uh, with an invoice example, you would say something like the data is unreadable. Now the, um, the escalation event is not interrupting. So in this case, we can still do our task, but we just need uh, an intermediary step. With an invoice example, that could mean that you may have to ask a colleague to check something, to validate something for you before uh, or uh, you can approve something, uh, which means you can still technically do the task, but something else needs to happen as well. They are the most common patterns around error handling, and most error handling can fit into one of those three ways. So we're moving on to pattern number two for this video, and it's about why and how to use subprocesses to make your model better. Now I have a relatively complicated model here. It's got a lot of symbols and that is important because that's the first kind of sign that you may be interested in trying to use subprocesses is if your model looks a little bit complicated because the two reasons you might want to use uh, subprocesses is number one, to reduce visual complexity. Now it doesn't reduce complexity on an uh, execution standpoint or on a technical level because it's just hiding it, but it makes models easier to read. If they're easier to read, it means they're easier to maintain and understand. 
Speaking of maintenance, the second reason would be to have a much easier time maintaining the model by removing uh, reusable factors to be edited in one place. So that means that if, for instance, we'll find out now, if something gets uh, something happens multiple times in the same model, it's a nice idea to have a single point where that is described. So let's talk through what's going to happen here. So I'm going to kick off the token simulator and now we're going to enjoy some fun with our friends. So we head to a bar, we sit down with our friends, we look at the menu and we have ourselves a beer, which is a good start. Next up, we basically play some board games, which is a fun thing to do. I finished my drink, decided on a new one, and this time I'm going to get a glass of wine, because why not? Then, of course, we're then I'm going to tell a hilarious anecdote and finish my drink, and fun time is had by all. There is our process. It's a really, really simple process. And that is a problem because the model is far more complicated than it needs to be. So next, I want to talk about the kind of things that I can see in this model that indicates to me we could use some subprocesses. You seem like very clever people, so I'm going to assume you already realize the bit I'm going to be talking about is going to be this order section, ordering uh, beer, wine, and mata, and ordering beer, wine, and mata. They are identical, they just happen to happen in different parts of the process. Very, very common, and you would immediately think, well, to make the model easier to read, I will abstract those into a subprocess. And that is a good idea, but it's not the only reason to do that. A very clear reason, as I mentioned already, this, the two very good reasons you would want to um, uh, abstract things is to make things readable, but don't forget maintenance. And that's really clear because if I wanted to add a new drink, let's say I wanted to have some water, which is healthy, I would need to add this every single time that I've called this process. And that's going to open you up to doubling the, the amount of time spent maintaining this, but also it's going to lead to possible mistakes. What if someone forgets to add the water to one of the drink options? It's not very convenient. So yeah, it's a pretty easy option to do that, but you might be looking a little bit too small scale because one of the things that we can also think about is where is the logical conclusion and a logical starting conclusion of our subprocess we want to abstract. Now, these are all duplicates, right? So clearly we could have a subprocess that starts. We then have three tasks, order a beer, order a wine, and order a mata, and then end the subprocess. But if we look a little closer, there's also duplication in logic, right? So we have here, look at the menu where we decide on our, on our beer. And we also have up here, decide on drink. So actually we could expand this subprocess to take into account a bigger logical block. So you shouldn't just look at the individual tasks, but think about the logical block that gets abstracted because actually what's been duplicated is not this, but actually this whole thing here. So if we take a look at what that might look like, we have a sub process here where we basically have, we want to drink, we look at the menu, Let's do token simulation because I cannot get enough of token simulation. Let's have a mata for a change. So we're going to get a mata and then we finish our order. Okay. Now what effect would this have on the overall subprocess, or the, or the overall process if we abstract it as a subprocess? Well, let's take a look. Well, here it is. And as you can see, I've just removed those logical blocks. I now have order drink and order drink, which does appear twice. And you can see right here, this is the original process. And then by abstracting those sections into subprocesses, we now have a much smaller process with this little chap here. And this then becomes reusable by different processes. So that's really good. But I want to talk about a way to make things a little more dynamic. So for instance, right now we've done a really good job of being able to abstract to subprocesses in order to make things more readable and make things more um, uh, maintainable. But what about making things more dynamic? So what is this advanced subprocess thing I'm going to talk about for more dynamicness? Well, generally speaking, in BPMN, being more dynamic means using event subprocesses. So let me explain, first of all, collectivities, which I use but didn't fully explain, are a link to another process model, right? So these both link to exactly the same process model, which is why we can maintain them in the same place. Super handy. They're deployed somewhere else, anywhere else can call them, really, really handy, but they are external. So the downside a little bit is that I need to actually go into that model to find out what's going on. That's one thing. The next is that 
you those who have played video uh, board games and I, I play a lot of board games and they last a lot longer than it takes to finish a single drink so rather than having to deal with the idea that I have to wait for these certain things to end I just want to have my drink whenever I uh, happen to um, I want it right whenever I want a drink I should 100% just get another one so that is where event sub process are going to come in. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide that we have a condition that will exist, that could exist at any point, which is I would quite like a uh, a drink, right? So let's drag this chap over here. This is important to, for UX perspective. I'm going to need to convert this to an event sub process for this next bit to work. And as soon as I do that, first of all, let me show you what a regular so, uh, start event looks like. It's got all these things. The start event of an event sub process has a lot more stuff because it can do a lot more. It can listen for events that could happen at any time. And in this case, we're going to choose a conditional non-interrupting start event. This means that I would like a drink. Okay, great. So at any point in this process, I might want a drink and this will get triggered. Then we're going to put my order drink thing here which means I can get rid of this so maybe while I sit down with friends I can also order a drink at the same time I uh, don't need this here either great and now oops that's a bit too much now we have this ability to any point during the process I can order a drink let me show you how this works from using token simulation so if I let's say well play a board game. Let's say we start here, I sit down with friends and then I decide to play a board game and I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a drink. Marvelous. I'm going to have another one. Fantastic. This can all happen in parallel and you see this does not get interrupted. So at any point this can be triggered by a condition being satisfied. So there's still a problem with our process which is this thing here. Now once again we have identified something which is happening multiple times finishing drink is now happening twice that doesn't need to we can actually now think back to what i initially said about abstracting logic another logical block is that after i order a drink i finish one so i can actually just put that right in here i don't need this anymore i don't need these i can just connect all these up like this get rid of finished drink so now i can just order a drink whenever i like and drink it on my own time and when I maybe I can order more than one as well so now I have the ability to if I start this process so now I can click here I can order my drink great I can have my drink there fantastic I can still do this also after I tell my funny funny anecdote I can still be finishing my drink and this can stay here even until I finish and then I can leave so let's see that what we've started with and what we've got right now using sub processes so we started with this monstrosity okay we then abstracted uh, uh some logic into uh um a call activity into a sub process which worked really well then we abstracted the additional logic of having to duplicate the sub process into an event sub process which gave us this really really cool very simple model to understand go team us so the final uh, little pattern we're going to talk about is a very, very common pattern. And it is one where we actually require approval from two different people in order for some item to uh, be uh, valid. In this case, we've chosen content with bit meta because I'm creating content. Let's see if it gets approved. This is basically the steps we take. So what will happen is um, I do my own review. I think I did great and I pass it on to my team and they think you did great, Niall. And then, oh, no, they didn't. Oh, that's really sad. So they almost thought I did great, but unfortunately I, I they didn't like the review, but don't worry because I can re-edit it and then change it again. And this time I approve it again. My team finally agrees it's okay. And then it can be published. That's pretty common. So what's the problem with this model? It actually works perfectly well. And that is true, it does. The problem is that we have some repetition and in, it's not a crime or anything, but if you had a very big process with loads of approval steps or loads of different things to be approved, you really have a problem of duplication of uh, reviewing plus this gateway. Is the review okay or not? Then reviewing again. Is it okay? Yes or no? So there's a lot going on. It feels like we can definitely improve this situation. So that's what we're going to do.
The very first change we want to make is remove this conduct second review because we don't need it. We already have a task that does the review. So we can get rid of that and let's just remove this as well. Let's remove everything. So after the review, if the content is not okay, we don't charge. That doesn't change. What are the possible options for if the content is okay? Well, we basically have two options. We either, um, do we need second review? If so, we go back here. Okay, that makes sense. And give it a second review. If we don't, we know it's already been approved twice. So that's it. So let's talk through how this would work with token simulation. So the first path would be that we conduct our review. Great, it goes through here. We need a second review because we owned it in one. We can have our second review, which also is okay, which means we don't need a second review. So we're done. Looks okay. We're doing we're doing just fine here. But we could actually do a little bit better because this whole gateway thing is a little bit complicated. But this loop is totally valid. It does remove the one problem, which is duplicating of tasks. But it, it looks a little messy. So there is a way to improve this a little bit more. So now let's get rid of some gateways. So an interesting thing we can do here is we can achieve this without using any gateways at all. Okay, we'll keep the end events though. So let's first of all remind ourselves of if we need to do the same thing multiple times, the best option is almost always um, a multi-instance. There's two kinds, there's a parallel and sequential. Um, the nice thing is we can probably do parallel, which would actually save us some time. There's no reason why not, and I'll explain why shortly. And we can just say, if we complete both, then content can be published. Great. So this can run for each approver. So this would be a user task, and then for each person who needs to approve, there will be an instance of this. So now you're probably wondering, how do we get to this lovely end event where we actually can't publish the content? Well, we can use our dear friend from the previous example, but the interrupting version, a conditional boundary event. So this is someone doesn't approve. So this is great because this means that if so both of these tasks will be active at the same time okay and therefore if one person approves it will wait for the second one if they both approve we go forward the other option is both their tasks are available in parallel if the first person uh, says no then this is a um interrupting boundary events will actually cancel all the instances of, that are available, other person will have their task disappear, it's no longer valid, and then we go down here. So here is actually probably the most compact and probably the most efficient way of modeling um, the, the multiple approver process. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed all the patterns you've learned in the last uh, 20 odd minutes. And uh, I hope we can chat again some other time. Please leave comments about patterns you're interested in seeing and perhaps I can then implement those later. Goodbye.